Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be talking about social stories. Now social stories also known by a few different uh, terms and there's always of course new programs coming out that sound all new and cool but effectively social stories are all the same thing whether they're called social scripts which means there's a bit of an emphasis on what students are, should be saying in a certain situation um, but I just use the general word social stories and um, what a social story is is a step-by-step -step guide, usually on a single piece of paper, usually nice and colourful, for students, particularly those with disabilities and disorders, and especially those for neurological disabilities and disorders uh, such as autism, uh, and students with uh, global developmental delay or um, uh, various other learning disorders. It gives them a step-by-step -step plan for what to do to help them to de develop some automation or automatic responses in what to do in stressful situations. So it is developed for stressful or I guess challenging situations. Right. And what it basically does is try to teach that student how to react in a way that is expected of them for that specific situation. Now, that may include, for example, uh, catching the bus. That's a common one that you see uh, in examples and things. It might be how to lose. So how to gracefully lose in a game, um, whether they're playing with friends or, you know, how to um, share might be another one. So, and there's a whole raft of uh, different social stories and different reasons for why we use uh, social stories. Quite often, uh, when there is a problem, the teacher, especially those who work with special needs quite often, uh, or for those that work with autism quite often, they'll quite often have, they'll usually have a book um, or a collection of social stories because they're used very uh, commonly. So, uh, what basically a social story looks like is actually, sorry, first, let's just go through a typical problem that you might have with a student uh, with a disability, say a year three student, but it could also be for any age group. So a problem uh, might go something like this. So one, uh, let's call this person, well, let's call them Adam. So Adam wants to play with Ted. So the problem becomes that um, Adam needs to get Ted's attention. Now this is where the problems start to happen and it's also important if you're developing social stories, which I highly recommend because you can very easily make these yourself. They're very simple. They're kind of fun to make. They don't take too long and every time you do them, you get better and better at them. I'll go through some rules for how to make here. I'll write this on the board so that I don't forget how to make here in a minute. Um, but basically, this is the general cognitive process I guess you will go through as you're trying to figure out specifically what the problem is so that you can then develop uh, the step-by-step -step process that you want students or the student to be able to do in some type of as close as possible to automation so that they forget the old way of uh, reacting so that they've got a new response. So that there is a new response when that uh, particular thing happens. So um, when, say, um, they catch the bus and other students are being very loud, they'll need to know what to do in that particular situation. Or they'll need to know how to lose if they're playing a ball game and they get tagged as being out and they're supposed to sit down. So this helps reinforce those social skills that they may not know how to do or what to do um, until they get exposed explicitly taught how to go about this process. So we'll go through here on how to make them, but we'll also go through how to deliver or how to teach. So I'll just go through sort of, I guess, some best practice ways about doing that. So if you're a parent and you've uh, never done this before, it'll give you an idea about how to do it at home. But it's relatively self-explanatory anyway, and you sort of get a feel for it once you've done it a couple of times. You might adjust it and do it differently for different kids, but generally, um, delivering it and making it is usually pretty simple.
particularly if you've followed this process and you've identified what the root cause of the behaviour is. So this is what we're getting at here, is identifying the root cause. And if you've seen my behaviour videos, hang on. Identify the root cause as opposed to the surface um, or what uh, surface uh, behaviour or what we just see because quite often the behaviour that we see is not actually the root cause and the student is going through um, those particular actions in order to send a message or in a reaction to something that's happened, uh, some type of trigger or whatnot. Um, that is, I guess you could call that an underlying cause. It's important to identify what the root cause is so that you can accurately come up with your social story. So uh, we'll go through those. Now, so first, the first thing that happens is that Adam wants to play with Ted. Um, and then Adam goes, well, you know, if I want to play with Ted, I'm going to have to get Ted's attention somehow. Um, so then what happens is Adam tries to get tries to get Ted's attention uh, by, let's say, um, well, let's just say talking, by talking. And we'll just write proximity. So what that basically means is that um, Adam made the decision that he wanted to get Ted's attention and thought to himself, how am I going to go about doing this? Um, probably what I need to do is talk to Ted and stand near them or get near them. So that's what I mean by proximity there. So unfortunately, Ted ignores Adam. Now sometimes this particular thing here won't happen and uh, Adam will jump straight to number four and just make the assumption that Ted is not paying attention to me Therefore, I need to do this. And they won't even try to get their attention using more, I guess, appropriate means in the first place. So they, quite often that's what happens. It'll go straight from, I need to get Ted's attention somehow. Well, how can I go about doing that? Um, I'm going to start throwing things at them. So that's what happens down here for number five. So the natural, or at least in Adam's mind, um, so at least in Adam's mind, um, he starts to think, okay, I need to get that, uh, that person's attention. The only way that I know how to do that, given that I have limited social skills, limited vocabulary, and limited confidence, is to throw things. I'm just going to throw things at Ted. Lovely handwriting there, Adam. So, Adam decides, I want to get Ted's attention. I'm going to start throwing things at Ted and I'm going to keep doing that. Now eventually, that could also involve pinching, it could involve pushing, it could involve a whole raft of different things. Stealing things, stealing some of Ted's possessions is a really common one. Um, name calling. So basically there are some inappropriate behaviours here that need to be dealt with. Um, and how the best way we can go about dealing with those behaviours so that... Uh, is using social stories. Now that allows Adam to still achieve the original goal because remember the original goal is still Adam wants to play with Ted. So, and in fact, actually the real goal here for us then is to teach Adam how he can best go about the process of being able to achieve that particular goal. And remember there are lots of different um, types of things here that we can also teach them. So um, this is just one particular uh, example. So you'll have to change things around. If it's, for example, how to share, um, then it might start up the top here with uh, Adam wants to play with Ted and um, it could be that Ted has, say, a... Uh, or Adam wants to play with the toy that Ted is currently playing with or something like that. And then we can go down and you can follow that process there. I don't necessarily think you need to write this out, but uh, you should definitely be thinking about the steps that are happening and what's going on so that you can identify that root cause of that behaviour. So the root cause of this behaviour is a lack of social skills and a desire to play with Ted. It is not a desire to throw things at Ted because this student is just a naughty student. Now that is called the surface behaviour. So the surface behaviour goes there. So all we, th all we see is Adam being a bit of a pain 
Adam being a difficult and annoying person, throwing things, breaking school rules. Now, the other thing to bear in mind as well is that even despite being in trouble and being told off, Adam may continue doing these negative behaviours because their natural instinct to socialise or their desire to socialise, their desire to meet that initial goal might significantly outweigh, in their opinion, the risk or the consequences imposed by the school or imposed by the teacher or the parents or whoever. So just also bear that in mind as well um, as you're going through and thinking about that. Now, um, and because sometimes consequences just aren't going to work. And in this, that's not to say you shouldn't have consequences, but uh, it's important not to just treat the surface behaviour. It's important to also think about um, identifying that root cause so that we can come over here and then start thinking about how we can replace um, this type of behaviour here with something that's actually going to work. Now, the other thing that, that I like to think of when I'm developing social stories is that yes, you're putting in a new response. So you want there to be a new response down here when that uh, event happens so that it's automative, uh, automatic or they just naturally start doing um, that particular action that you're teaching them. That comes, of course, from repetition. I'm just going to write rep. Obviously, repetition, like anything in teaching, it quite often has that element of repetition, going through the social story multiple times and so on and so forth. Obviously, it has to be understandable and clear and all this kind of thing. But um, going through it multiple times, it may not happen the first time, but eventually it will happen. And where I'm really trying to get here is this idea of reward replacement. Oh, no, just reward, sorry, and extinction. Now, extinction basically is a term from applied behaviour analysis, which is just this sort of program that is used quite often for students with disabilities. And the word extinction means in terms of, sorry, um, the behaviour. You're trying to make that particular behaviour there extinct for this and similar contexts as well. So not just when Adam wants to play with Ted, but also if Adam wants to share with Ted or if Adam wants to play a game or if Adam wants to talk to a teacher or if Adam wants to, or whatever the thing is that's related um, to this social story, you're trying to make that negative behaviour extinct. So if they're trying to get attention of you know, whoever um, or interact or socialise uh, and so on. So what you're doing is you're also playing with the reward. So in Adam's, you're, when I say playing with the reward, you're showing them that to get a reward for their behaviour, there are easier ways to do it than throwing things or biting or pushing or whatever it is. So also got to think of social stories in terms of the reward that the student gets at the end. And the reward is usually related to whatever their goal is. So even if it's a bus, so a student's on a bus, um, quite often we talk about social stories in relation to autism. Students on a bus, uh, the noise gets too loud and they have a meltdown. So um, by having a meltdown, they're seeking to try to, usually if they're running away, they're trying to escape or they're trying to communicate that, uh, you know, I can't stand this situation, I need to leave, etc., etc. So you're trying to replace the reward that they're seeking with an alternative reward. So um, if you try to think about social stories in that sense, uh, I think it starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, I just wanted to quickly rub this off because, yes, I'm trying to get through this one a little bit quicker because the last couple of webinars I did went for way too long. Now, just quickly, I just want to show you kind of what a social story looks like, although it will be easier if you just Google it. But basically, it has a title at the top and then you can do it in a number of different ways. This is how I do it. And you can do it on a single piece of paper, multiple pieces of paper with card, cut out uh, magazines and use fancy pictures. You can use clip art uh, or whatever. And then here, so you'll have a picture here. So this will be a picture, this will be a picture, this will be a picture, this will be a picture. Another reason why social stories are used throughout the world, particularly with students with neurological issue, uh, disorders, is because a lot of those students are non-verbal or sort of towards the non-verbal um, level of ability, I guess. So being able to use more pictorial type of visual cues uh, is very, very effective. So you'll have a picture of some description there. Now, normally that one will be uh, Adam wants to play with Ted. So you'll have maybe stick figures there or something along those lines. 
Um, uh, maybe it can be a person sitting there, standing there like this or whatever. So you'll have some type of picture that clearly indicates that bit there. So I'm just going to say that's number one. And then in number one, yeah, you might actually write in. Sorry, I'll just write that in. Adam wants to blah, 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 blah. And number two, so what, what do you want Adam to then do? So you would say, Adam walks over and stands near Ted. And then you'll have a picture of two people standing next to each other. And then here is where we might add in some other bits and pieces or some other steps, sorry, bits and pieces, some other steps about what we want Adam to do. So Adam quietly asks, no, let's say Adam says hello to Ted. So we'll keep it super simple. Hello to Ted. And then the next one might be, Adam says, hello to Ted. And then the next one might say something like, Adam asked Ted if he can also play or something like that. So there's a procedure there that you follow. Normally I recommend, and if you, you find them online, they, can, they, can, they range, but um, if you go beyond 10 or 12, you're probably making it too long and too complicated. And maybe you would need to divide them up into different social stories. But that's really up to you. At the end of the day, if it's addressing the behavior, you can do the social story in any way that you want. You could use little individual cards with a little sentence at the bottom. It really doesn't matter. That's my preferred method. I don't make these up all the time. I've used them in the past and made a few up. Um, but uh, you know, I don't make hundreds of these. So um, I'm, I'm sure if I was making lots of them, as some of the people watching this video will be, uh, there'll be a you'll come up with a range of different creative ways to do it. The most important thing is to remember the reward at the end, to remember that you're trying to uncover what the root cause is, because you need to know that root cause so that you can develop it, um, and to be going through in a very step-by-step -step fashion with an emphasis on the pictures. So there's a big emphasis on the visual aspect um, of the social stories. Very simple title, nice and aesthetically pleasing, set out in a very child-friendly type of manner. Um, this is not meant to be some type of essay or something complicated or anything like that. As simple as you possibly can. If you've got a very clear goal for what you're trying to achieve, regardless of the intellectual capacity of the student, you can still make this as simple as possible. And the more simple and clear you can make it, uh, the better. Now, um, just quickly, I've already been through how to make, I guess, so uh, you would, so firstly, understand or uncover uh, the root cause. So just make sure you understand that. And you're also understanding the, how their disability or how their disorder affects that behavior. So there's an, also an important link there as well, because that may have some type of bearing um, on how you go about developing this or teaching it. So number two is always the pictures. And obviously you could do a little draft or something, but I mean, you can quickly smash these out and do them in five seconds on Microsoft Word. It doesn't have to be something that takes hours, five minutes or so, and you can have one that works perfectly well and is just as good as one that you could spend three hours doing. You can copy and paste them. Um, and you can even make, uh, get kids to make them as well. They can actually help you develop these. So anyway, you put in your pictures, you do your basic, uh, I'm just going to say text. So that's a sentence, single sentence. Again, it doesn't have to be, but I like to do even partial sentences, half sentences, three words, five words, that type of thing. Very, very simple. Um, and then that is it. That's all you have to do. You can purchase these online if you want to get ones that are nice and pretty, um, particularly the ones where you get them in packs and things. But uh, I've seen uh, some of the books that you can buy that are full of social stories and you get, I don't know, 99 social stories or whatever. They can be prohibitively expensive. I think I saw one the other day um, when I was looking up something different and uh, uh, the books for social stories for autism are like, you know, $215 and stupid things like this. So I think if that's the case, I prefer to do everything myself. Now, I've probably got a little bit more experience than... Um, than some people, but I do like to do all of these myself. If I'm developing lesson plans, if I'm developing resources, 
and um, so forth because I think you can really tailor it to what you want. So again, if you've got those main concepts down pat, then um, they're very easy to do. And once you've done a few of them, you'll just fly through them. They're very simple. And I don't think you're going to need 99 social stories or 100 social stories. If there's an issue, develop a social story for it. If there's another issue, develop another social story. If that social story doesn't work, change it up and do something slightly different. Okay, so how to deliver. So this is probably, I guess, more, um, more of the practical side of it because there's lots of articles online uh, about social stories because it's a very popular, uh, well-known strategy. Um, but very few actually go through the process and show you it for parents or for beginning teachers, teacher aides and so forth, how to actually deliver a social story. So first and foremost is, once you've got it all down pat, you have a few different options. Best practice is to do it in small groups. Uh, I probably wouldn't do it one-on-one. -on -one. I think that might be uh, quite intimidating for a student. You don't want them to feel like they're in trouble. This is supposed to be something of a fun, almost a leisure activity, almost like a game. Um, and it doesn't hurt for students, uh, just your neurotypical students, your non-disabled students, to go through and do social stories as well. Quite often teachers will do these for two or three minutes at the start of a lesson for the entire class, even though they're kind of directing it at one student. Maybe not for something as simple as this, um, but if you're talking about anger management or about sharing and those types of things, quite often in, say, a year one class, uh, it wouldn't hurt for the whole class to spend a few minutes on that one. So how to deliver? Usually it's small groups. Uh, I would probably do it as a combination of maybe small groups and individual, but it depends on the time you've got. Sometimes giving that student a buddy uh, can be enough to just help reduce that intimidation that comes with one-on-one. -on -one. If you're working with a student all the time and you're a teacher aide uh, or even the teacher and you've got plenty of spare time then, or your period of time where you can work with that student 101 uh, or a parent or caregiver or whatnot and you've got that existing relationship, then certainly doing it on 101 uh, is possible. But uh, I would probably, let's just say small group and it really only has to be, say, I don't know, 10 minutes. It's not a long activity. Uh, but you want to make it as light-hearted and as fun as possible. Um, and from there, I would probably go through, and let's say you've got the kids sitting on the floor, so it's informal. They're not sitting in straight rows of desks or anything. So um, I'll, let's, let's call it on the floor. So on floor. And then the third thing you'll be doing is using that nice, friendly tone, asking for students to say, what does this title say? So it's very... You're getting that interactivity, interactivity and opportunities to respond. Now, obviously, we all know that there's tons of research that says the more students can engage and respond and um, contribute to the lesson and answer questions and so forth, the more they understand, conceptualise and remember things. So the more opportunities to respond that you can provide, the better. Um, so you're trying to be, you're trying to have as much back and forth as possible. So that may look like, okay, what does this title say? Does anyone want to read this out? What do you think this social story will be about? Or what do you think is going to happen in this particular story? Let's have a guess. So you're just asking various different sort of predictive questions based on, you might have a single picture that's at the front that has a title across the top and then this opens up to the next page or whatever. So from there, we might ask uh, individual students or a particular student, um, or we'll just pose the question then wait a couple of seconds and then choose a student to ask, what is happening in this particular picture here? And then see if you can um, generate a little conversation for 30 seconds around that. What do you think is happening? What do you think is happening? So on and so forth. Okay, does anyone want to read this out for me? And then someone will, you choose a volunteer to read that one out and you can follow along. You can get students to follow along with you so they repeat after you. So you say, Adam wants to blah, 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 and then the students can repeat after you. There's various different ways you can do it, various different, I guess, various different approaches depending on the student. But either way, you're not just reading through it in 30 seconds. You're going through each bit so that students get a feel for what's going on. How I would, another way to do it, or how I would probably do it, is go through that one little bit at a time and introduce students to it, have that sort of interactivity happening. But then at the very end, uh, asking lots of questions and so forth, in the very end, I would go through, I'm going to write quickly. No, I don't want to use the word quickly.
Yeah, we'll go. We'll say at normal speed. Go through at normal speed. Sorry about my writing. It's really hard to write down there. Um, so you would go through and spend a minute here, a minute here, a minute here, a minute here. You might have a chat to students who are like, okay, so this was the first thing that happens and this is the second thing. Why do you think we do that? What's going on there? What, 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 what is the important um, reason for why we walk over and stand near Ted and we don't just run over and jump on him or whatever? So you're asking some hypothetical questions as well. Obviously, again, depending on the student. And then at the very end, once you've gone through it all, you can then ask some questions of the students. So you could get them to practice or, and what I've written here, go through at a normal speed. I would start at the top and go through it one bit at a time and read it out. And I would probably then point out and say, okay, let's just quickly run over this and summarize it. This, read that out and then say, and here we have a picture of blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing that Adam does is he walks over and he stands near Ted. And here's a picture of Adam walking over and standing near Ted. Obviously, you're not going to be talking as quickly as I'm talking right now and so on and so forth. So that is the basics of how to deliver. The other thing I would add in there is five. I would add in repeat, repeat and repeat. Because doing that once isn't going to solve your problems. You're going to have to do that six times, I would say. Three to six times at a minimum. So what you might end up doing is, you let's say you do that on Monday. You might do it on Wednesday. And you might do it on Friday. Like that. Good. So you might do it three times. It might only take two minutes. By the time you get to this Friday one, it's a quick reminder. By the time you get to that one, you could be getting the individual student to work through uh, and do it for you and to read it through for you and get them uh, to explain it just before they go off at the end of the day or before they go to lunchtime where they might run into that situation as well. Uh, there's another strategy, by the way, called uh, peer learning where you can get that student's peer involved so you could get Ted involved and you can run through these scenarios and work, get Ted to work with Adam to try and uh, demonstrate best practice or demonstrate and model what the behaviour uh, looks like and even get Ted to sort of simulate this so that that way you can practice and so on. So you've got quite a few different options there. Uh, but the point I'm trying to get across here is doing that once isn't going to work. There is that repetition. And also... Um, doing that not only just for once or twice. The first time you go through it, let's say it takes 20 minutes. The second time might be 10 minutes and the third time might be, say, eight minutes. Um, not only are you doing it a few times to really consolidate it, to get that space learning thing happening, which is another video. Watch that if you haven't already. Uh, but you might then do it. You might not do it on, the week, on week two. You might just remind the student. So you might just uh, provide what is known as a pre-correction. So before they go out for lunch on each day, not every day, but on a regular basis, you might say, oh yeah, just remember Adam, what we were, remember that social story that's hanging on the wall just there, go through and quickly read that. Once you've quickly read it, let's go out to recess or let's go out to lunch or whatever. So you're giving them those reminders um, so that they regularly have to, uh, again, using those sp what we know about space learning and how the brain physically works, we take that information from long-term memory, pull it to our short-term memory or to what's happening right now, to what is known as our working memory. Every time we do that, those connections between those two parts of the brain go stronger and get more effective and efficient and that automation develops and things as well. Eventually, uh, and even if you're going to remind them the next week, but you might then have a bit of a gap depending on how they're going and just revisit it every month or so uh, just to try and, as needed of course, just to try and prevent... Um, I was going to use the word recidivism, but that's probably not the right word, trying to prevent it from happening over and over again or from coming back, say, three months later and then you have to go through the process again. So a little review slash reminder now and then um, is always best practice. So that's the basics of social stories and good luck.